Hello right, guys, so hopefully everyone can see me and hear me. Um, just uh, send through if you can't, obviously. First time using this piece of software, so fingers crossed it all works, technology and all that. Um, so welcome to today's webinar, uh, where today we're going to be talking a little bit about um, some introduction to physical preparation, so specifically for the multi-eventer, uh, but potentially also emphasising um, an athlete potentially uh, going on to specialise in the throws, so uh, looking in particular at that. A um, bit of an introduction to myself uh, for those that don't know me. Um, I'm a Sport Wales strength and conditioning coach, um, primarily working with Welsh Athletics and Disability Sport Wales with Athletics. So i um, probably been working with uh, these guys for about two or three years now. Um, and so today, I guess it's a bit of uh, theory and principles from my world of physical preparation. Uh, some example exercises uh, and then how to put that together into a, a real tangible program that will hopefully deliver some value to you and your athletes. Um, so without further ado, we'll get started. Okay, so slides are changing. So firstly, um, when thinking about uh, putting any together, form of intervention together for an athlete, um, we first got to remember well, what are the actual physical building blocks of a developing athlete? What makes a good athlete? Um, so for myself, uh, I like to kind of uh, break it down like this. So there's event performance, which is obviously impacted on by coordination and skill. So the actual technique of the, of the actual event itself, uh, the athlete's physical attributes. And so we both have things that are not changeable, such as height and structure. And things that are changeable, so such as you know, flexibility and strength qualities, which we'll get into later. And then psychology and attitude, which obviously underpins uh, the other two as well in terms of their consistency of training and their attitude towards training and competition. And, and it's important to mention that these three aren't kind of distinct and separate. They all interrelate. Uh, and that's why kind of physical preparation becomes important for athletics, just because um, you can't separate the two so, so distinctly. So, for example, um, you know, someone's coordination and skill uh, in their event, potentially they're not uh, quite getting the technique that you need to get them to, to get. Maybe there's a physical limitation that's actually holding them back from that. Um, and likewise, someone's physical attributes could affect their technique. So essentially, we see lots of individuals with different styles and, and different little different things, even at the elite level, um, that we notice and potentially due to changes in their you know, differences in their structure, differences in, in how they're built. Uh, so we don't necessarily want to change those things because that's kind of individual to them. Um, now getting a bit, bit more depth into these physical attributes and what are they, I like to break them down into three kind of pillars. Uh, mobility, so how much range of motion we have at a joint, strength, how much force we can produce over an unlimited period of time, and power, so how much force we can produce uh, really quickly. Uh, and again, you can further separate these into uh, linear movements, so that's going straight forwards and backwards, uh, and rotational movements. So you've almost got six categories. Uh, so if I give you some practical examples of that, um, so example of an exercise might be of linear strength, would be something like a squat, straight up and down, or a bench press perhaps. So whilst rotational power, maybe I'm going to use a, a med ball throw or something like that. So as you can see, two different exercises you might already commonly use, uh, two different kind of categories. Um, and linear rotational, they're both really important uh, aspects of physical um, preparation. Uh, even in, you know, ob obviously in the throws, there's a big rotational component on a lot of them, uh, so we can see why that might be the case. But even in things like sprinting and jumping, you know, sprinting, often people think of that as a linear movement, it's straightforward, it's in a straight line. But in fact, obviously, we're, we're working one limit at a time, so there's going to be rotational or resisting rotational forces aspects of, of that movement too. Now, in terms of um, kind of figuring out, okay, I've got my six pillars because that's that's quite a lot of things to work on. So in terms of being able to emphasise um, specific ones, um, I guess 
Firstly, what you need to do is identify what I call performance problems. So what are the limiting factors that are going to hold this athlete back or what are the factors that when addressed can take them up to that next level? Um, and of course, um, there's a process that you can go through to, to try and kind of uh, identify these things. So observe, speculate, a plan, do and review. So if I go through those in a bit more depth, um, so in the observation phase, you're asking yourself this question, what am I seeing uh, both in the event uh, and in general? So to give you some examples of what that might look like, maybe in the event I'm seeing a thrower that can't maintain a good uh, angle of separation throughout the movement. Uh, and in general, maybe I'm just seeing this athlete, he walks around and he's a bit of a, a hunchback position. He's, he's got a curvature in his spine. Which brings me to my next point, uh, what patterns can I kind of identify from this? So potentially now I'm starting to link those things. Are they related or not? Uh, then I'm coming into my speculation phase. So why am I seeing this? I'm asking myself, uh, why might this be the case? Why is this pattern a thing? Uh, is it an awareness issue? So maybe I'm working on technique, um, but the athlete's not getting it. Maybe they're just not aware of what I'm trying to get them to do. Is it a practice issue? So is it that they're aware of what I'm trying to get them to do, but potentially they just haven't practiced it enough to make it automatic and, and integrated? Or is it a physical issue? So maybe you've ticked the other two off. Uh, you're sure that the athlete's aware of what they're trying to do. You're sure the athlete's practiced enough to, to be able to get it, but they're still not able to get that. And, you, and you're queuing and queuing, but potentially you're not going to get any further if they've actually got a physical issue which is holding them back, which is where physical preparation comes in. Um, and then finally, plan, do, review. So this is where you start thinking about how will I actually address this? Um, doing, performing the plan, and then also reflecting and reviewing on it afterwards. Did it work? So sport is a, a complex environment, uh, which means we can never really be certain what's going to work and what's not. You know, anyone that pretends to have certainty in sport uh, is probably selling you some snake oil. So um, did it work? You're asking yourself, OK, if it did work, when you're going back to your observation phase, are you, are you seeing the, the change that you wanted to see? Um, and if you are, great. What can I learn from this? What can I take forward with my other athletes? Um, and also, if it didn't work, what am I going to try again next time? Why might not that have not worked? So now, just to take you back into the first physical pillar, so maybe you've identified that there is a physical kind of a limitation that might be holding an athlete back. Now, in terms of mobility, there's three key areas where we need mobility in our athletes. The thoracic, which is um, on the picture, shown on the picture on the bottom left here, uh, the, the upper back, essentially, the, the upper portion of your spine. Uh, the hips and the ankles. Now, uh, why do we need mobility in these areas? Uh, I'm going to get into that in a bit more depth, but essentially to be able to hit the shapes uh, that I want to hit in the technique of the throw um, or in any type of physical preparation movements. So I'm going to focus a bit more on the thoracic and then I'll go on to the other two. So in thoracic mobility, we need it in two planes of motion extension and rotation so just as an example here uh, hopefully you can see the picture that's just come up so flexion uh, that's forward that's i guess your typical hunchback posture and extension is where you're sitting up nice and straight okay you can try that even in your chair so why do we want extension well essentially we want a posture that we can produce effective force from and that allows us to get into good ranges of motion OK, so um, you can even try this out a little bit uh, and you can see how it's related to rotation, which is the uh, second movement, as you, as you can see on the bottom right here. So these two are, two are related um, and say, for example, you know, you've got an athlete that can't achieve a good degree of separation. That might give you an illusion to potentially that an athlete might have a, a mobility deficiency in this area if you've already ticked off those two areas of awareness um, and practice. So you can try this out and see how these are related yourself because in your chair now you can uh, you know, find your flexion position. So just hunch over your shoulders and try and rotate. See how much range of motion you get. 
Everyone tried that. And now extend, so hands behind the head, nice and tall. Again, see how much range of motion you get. Hopefully, you should see that with the uh, extension position, you can get a lot more range of motion. So you can see, uh, even though it may not be immediately obvious, a thrower that's potentially struggling to get a good degree of separation, potentially it's not just obviously look at rotation, but also the, the extension around the thoracic. There's the, also the second area, which is the hips. Um, and we're going to need mobility in both extension, which is essentially how hard far your thigh that uh, can drop below that midline in that in that picture there and it's rotation now, these are going to be both important so for example um being able to hit the positions you want to hit and whether it be a throw or a jump or a sprint um, and also for producing effective power so extending the hips uh, the glutes are our largest muscle group so being able to whether it be a sprinter trying to sprint forwards and produce extended hips and produce a lot of power forwards, or whether that be a thrower trying to sprint towards the center of, of the circle and sprint phase. And finally, the ankles. Um, and these essentially, again, is how far forwards can your knee go over your toes. Now, you don't want to have excessive mobility here uh, because obviously uh, being able to have ankles that are also kind of able to transmit force effectively and not too too floppy if that makes sense uh, but essentially you want to be able to have a good enough ankle mobility that that athlete can squat effectively so that the a sprinter can maintain a forward shin angle in the acceleration phase of the sprint or whether a thrower in the sprint phase of a throw towards the middle of the circle uh, can effectively create that positive forward shin angle too so those might allude to where essentially or why we need that mobility in terms of uh, again some some photos for you here just to show you some examples and um, so this is kind of looking more at hip extension some examples of hip extension i found uh, looking at sprints and the jumps and the throws that you all need a high degree of hip separation to or hip sorry hip extension to produce a lot of power uh, whether that be in a sprint a jump or a throw you can imagine if an athlete actually can't get into that position in the first place because you know, potentially the, the generation that we're working with, uh, these younger athletes, uh, video games, uh, they're sitting in school as well all day. So you can imagine that creates some issues around the thoracic, around the hips especially. Uh, and if they can't actually get into those positions, you know, it's, it's going to be a hard ask to, to get them to produce you know, a lot of force and hit the positions that we want them to hit. So in terms of actually improving mobility, um, and as I go through these kind of three pillars of physical preparation, uh, I'm going to go through this process of talking about when, uh, so when it's appropriate to, to work on this aspect, how uh, you'd actually effectively do that, and then some examples of, of what exercises might be appropriate. So for improving mobility, uh, when is this appropriate? In the warm-up for sure so hopefully we already do some of this aspects of you know our dynamic mobilizations in our warm-up but essentially um again working back to pinpointing those three regions as well uh, and also using that uh the, the identifying performance problems process we can maybe be, be a bit more specific around that so say use my earlier example um thrower is struggling to achieve a good degree of separation in the throw you know, potentially in this warm up, I'm going to emphasize some thoracic mobility drills, uh, and hopefully that's going to be then later integrated into his event specific work. At home, I can do it at home. So, um, whilst this I might not get too much as quality out of this, the session, potentially depending on the age and the motivation levels of the athlete uh, as putting in their warm up, because again, they're going to be doing this during their own time. But it does make it, the, it makes it more time efficient. So if I've only got a limited time amount with that athlete, and I'm confident that athlete has the clarity that they need uh, and the motivation that they need to do, be able to do uh, some mobility stuff at home, I can certainly set that. But just being aware that um, you know, adherence um, isn't always going to be as good as you'd hope. And then post session as well. So uh, you know, after the session, maybe this is your more traditional stack stretching. Uh, although remember. It, if your sessions are going on to an hour, an hour and a half, and then uh, and potentially two hours, and then athletes are, are wanting to go home, you may not again get the quality that you want out of that post-session mobility. So it's really going to depend on 
what your athletes, uh, your ages are, how long your sessions are, what the set of your kind of individual constraints are, when that might be best placed. In terms of actually how to most effectively go about improving mobility, um, I think the most important thing uh, to remember with mobility is that our aim with it is not to get flexible, but our aim is to actually transfer to event performance. So in order to do that a bit more effectively, rather than just doing you know, traditional stretching um, and then not really integrating that into the event specific work, uh, I like to go through this process whereby, you know, we're integrating everything seamlessly into to the event specific stuff. Really. So I'm working on my mobilizations first in my specific areas, which I've already kind of targeted based on my observations. And then going into some more dynamic movements. So this is where maybe the foundational movements come in, like the squat, the lunge, the crawl, yeah, which, which should be talked a lot about in previous presentations. And then that allows me to kind of feel out that new range of motion within my dynamic movement. So I can start to feel that in a bit more of a specific way. And then I'm going to my event specific drills. So I'm actually trying to, and I'm still trying to create awareness in the athlete of you know, that new range of motion that they found uh, in their mobilizations and actually trying to integrate that into uh, the event specific work. So for a specific example of this, um, again, sticking with um, the thrower with a potentially not as good separation as I'd like. Um, so working on some thoracic extensions over a foam roller uh, and a thoracic kind of mobilization on the bottom left. So that's all on the left, those are my mobilizations. Now in the middle, I'm starting to get a bit more dynamic. So looking at some dynamic kind of rotation around the thoracic region. And then finally going into some throwing drills uh, where I'd emphasize kind of separation. So potentially either by the way that drill is designed or potentially just the way that I'm cueing that athlete. Um, and hopefully then that kind of newfound mobility that they've got from doing the mobilizations is actually integrated into kind of event specific work. Uh, an example for the hips, specifically hip extension here. So some mobilizations on the left, then I'm going to a dynamic movement, so a, a reverse lunge, where I'm, again, again that's an emphasis, uh, emphasizing the hip extension aspect of it, and really feeling that out, and then going potentially into my more event-specific drills. And then just to put that all together, uh, and I'm going to go through in terms of, uh, I guess, give examples based on a case study, so a hypothetical athlete, um, whose background is that they're a multi-event athlete starting to specialize in the discus. Uh, they struggle to achieve good separation and throw, uh, and it doesn't seem to be an awareness or a practice issue. I'll take those two things off. So I'm probably thinking it's maybe a physical limitation. Uh, the athlete spends a lot of time at a desk. They're a college student, so I potentially know they're going to be in this kind of hunchback position a lot. So, okay, this starts to, to add, a, again, a show a pattern potentially. And then uh, my program that I might build around that would be uh, based upon this. So you can see uh, my emphasis here is keeping the pre-session one short and sharp and really focused. So I'm really just opening up the thoracic, uh, doing the mobilizations, doing the dynamic uh, rotation stuff, and then going into the drills and exercise separation, just as per the example uh, that I gave earlier by the, the photos. Uh, by the way, guys, um, if this is too much to read at one time, the slides will be available afterwards, so you can always look through these. Um, and then I'm also going to give this athlete uh, some home mobility stuff. You know, they're a college student, so potentially, hopefully, they're starting to get a bit more motivated uh, to do this sort of stuff at home. So a full body foam rolls where I can, I guess, have, they've got a little bit more time to do this sort of stuff. Thoracic extension, some static stretching, some side lying arches, which is a, a rotation drill, uh, some wall angels. So that's all my thoracic stuff, which obviously is a big emphasis for him. Uh, and then working on some kind of hip flexor length, so hip flexor stra static stretching, and some glute bridging as well for, for activation due to that kind of being set, sat down a lot. So tackling the tight hips and, and the lack of glute activation. So hopefully, um, yeah, again, you can, you can find videos of these sort of exercises on, uh, on YouTube sort of thing if you need to. And now the second physical pillar uh, is power. So how do we develop power? The ability to produce force very quickly. Uh, and I guess uh, I'd put it in 
Uh, a bit of a pyramid model. There's three aspects of, of power training that you can you can or categories of exercises that you might work on. Number one, the event itself. So I think so commonly we forget about this. So actually, you know, just doing the event itself is a form of specific power kind of training. Um, and obviously that's going to make up the bulkier training. So that's why it's on the bottom of the pyramid. However, there's only so much of that stuff you can do before either it gets repetitive uh, or potentially people pick up injuries. Uh, so obviously it's important to vary this up as well. So for example, med ball stuff. Um, and pretty much most people should be competent enough to throw a med ball. Um, and finally, on the, the top of the pyramid there is, is plyometrics. Um, so this might be against the top of the pyramid because you potentially want to do a little bit less of this stuff. Like sprinting and jumping is already plyometric. So, um, you know, you don't want to add more on top of more. But um, with the plyometric stuff, it can be a great addition uh, as long as it's appropriate for the individual that you're working with. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. So when is this stuff appropriate? Uh, in the warm-up, uh, during, or post? So pretty much whenever during the session. However, uh, there are going to be a few specific kind of um, implications for, for the trainings for where I actually put it. So for example, uh, in the warm-up, obviously I don't want to carry over fatigue into the main technical session. So I'm potentially going to keep it quite short quite brief, and the rest periods may be a little bit longer. Uh, for the during the session, so potentially this could be a great uh, way to add some extra power training if you've got a big group of athletes, um, they can't all use the track or the, the throwing circle at once, especially if there's socially distancing going on at the moment, potentially. So this can be a great way to almost um, ensure that athletes aren't sitting around waiting in between uh, kind of throws or, or whatever that might be. Um, again, just to not implicate uh, and, and negatively impact on the event itself and the technique, you probably don't want to do a load of it. So it's going to be, again, only a few sets and reps for that. And then post-session as well. This, again, now maybe fatigue is less of an important factor because uh, it doesn't matter as much. You've done your event-specific work. So, um, again, this might be where you can potentially do something that's a little bit more fatiguing. How do you actually go about implementing this effectively? Uh, well, number one is that it needs to be athlete appropriate, which you kind of alluded to earlier with the plyometrics. So you're thinking to yourself, and again, using your observation skills like does uh, the shapes that you're seeing look right? Uh, you know, does it look similar to when an elite or an older athlete does it? Um, and using your common sense a little bit in this case, um, you know, usually if it looks good, um, it's okay. Um, does it sound good for biometrics? Um, and also, like, bearing in mind the background of the athlete in terms of their injury history, in terms of their age, in terms of their training history. You know, potentially you're going to have very different implications for, you know, potentially a, um, a heavier, taller female athlete uh, compared to potentially, you know, a, a smaller male, younger, um, potentially multi-events athlete. So different, uh, yeah, using your common sense and your eyes to be able to see what's appropriate for that individual. Uh, the intent behind it for power production, it needs to be maximal. So the old saying, train slow, be slow, comes to mind a little bit here. So as long as the athletes have clarity that they need to do that and why that's important, then usually that's enough to, to get them to help it produce you know, the, the, the maximal attempts required out of these exercises to be more effective and appropriate recovery periods, which uh, which relates to the um, what I just mentioned about intent uh, and maximal application of force. So not being so fatigued or tired um, that you can't then apply maximal force in, in the short period of time that you have. Now, here's some examples um, for you. So um, in this case, this is something that I might use in the warm up. So the athletes have just been instructed to use a chest pass type movement. Um, treat the med ball like a hot potato. Um, and this might be something you use in the warm up. It's quite enjoyable, it's a bit of fun, um, but it also raises the body temperature and also gives good, some good power production kind of qualities we can get out of it. Warm up game two. So this is a little bit more of a um, rotational emphasis now. They've been instructed to throw it a bit more like a rugby ball. And 
again, we're not using loads and loads of sets and reps for doing this for a long time uh, because the emphasis is that we're not causing too much fatigue um, that negatively carries over to the event specific work. And you could change the uh, kind of uh, difficulty of this exercise by, for example, increasing the distance or decreasing the distance between the athletes or using different uh, weight metals as well. So then, for example, maybe in between event specific work, if I've got a large group of athletes, this might be the type of exercise I can use. Again, not using a whole lot of sets and reps because I don't want to cause too much fatigue. Um, and it's quite a simple one. You know, it doesn't require a lot of setup. It doesn't require a lot of space. Uh, it's quite simple. It's not going to like confuse the athlete in terms of then going into um, you know a very technical as opposed to using a very technical exercise in this period and then finally uh, a finisher type exercise so athlete is uh slamming the med ball against the wall trying to use i guess the, the stretch shortening cycle to be to be quick and explosive here and because this is slightly higher reps uh, this might be something you put at the end as a bit of a finisher make the athletes help them feel like they've worked hard at the end of the session uh, and obviously hopefully not impact negatively with the terms of fatigue. Now, in terms of uh, plyometrics and example exercises, um, so this is uh, POGOs, uh, a really underrated exercise in my opinion. I mean, I know it's probably quite common uh, and quite bread and butter potentially, but I can't understate how important like, ankle stiffness is. So the ability to transfer force through the ankles uh, and even with your older, potentially more elite athletes, um, you know, they're just going to get more height for this exercise. So it becomes almost a different exercise um, or increases in difficulty depending on the, the, the strength and power of the athlete anyway. Um, and a slightly more advanced exercise. So this is a depth jump to a box. Now, again, you're going to have to use your eyes and your common sense a little bit here to judge if this is appropriate for the athlete. Um, you know, potentially... If I'm seeing um, you know, knees caving in here, uh, maybe I'm seeing them just not get the height required, um, then I might adjust the difficulty of this exercise by decreasing the box height, um, take, taking away the box in front of them potentially, just for emphasis, emphasis on the landing um, and other things I can do to, to achieve that. Now, just to put it together in a bit of an example program, so again, the same case study athlete. It's a multi-event athlete starting to specialize in the throws. Uh, 16 years old, currently going through a growth spurt. So now my observation skills, I'm trying to think, okay, going through a growth spurt, maybe implications for injury or, you know, like if their bones are suddenly getting a lot longer than, than their width, um, and that might be have, have implications for how they start to move. They're playing team sports outside of athletics. So again, it adds sort of more data to the picture. Um, you know, potentially is this athlete doing sprints uh, and, and stuff outside uh, and jogging or jumping outside of, of the, the stuff that I'm doing with them? Potentially that's going through my head at this point. And finally, uh, reported some knee pain in December last year at the end of winter training. So again, I'm going to use this to kind of inform what I do with this athlete, okay? Putting all these things together, growth spurt, playing team sports outside of athletics, reported some knee pain in December last year. Okay, I'm potentially not going to go too heavy on the plyometrics type stuff. Potentially, I'm going to focus more on the med ball stuff, which I know is going to be a bit safer for him. And finally, he's in a big group of athletes, six to eight of them. So rather than them waiting around, waiting for the throw circle or whatever piece of equipment I'm using with them, um, having some stuff in the, the, the kind of during and, and superset in this is a bit of a kind of almost like stations or, or a circuit type format could be helpful. So here's what that might look like. So the warm up, mobility routine that I've already mentioned, uh, the real basic kind of plyometrics. So jumping for height and sticking the landing, okay? Because I don't want to overload that, that aspect of the training too much. The med ball pass game. Uh, that was shown on video, great warm up game. And then during, uh, whilst waiting to throw, um, this might be where I do uh, some med ball vertical tosses for five reps uh, whilst I'm waiting to throw. 
and using that to build a circuit station. And then finally, going on to my remember rotational wall passes, again, as video, so almost exactly as, as the examples and sessions, I can, I can use that as a bit of a finisher. Um, and finally, the third physical pillar, which is strength. So strength can be separated into three kind of categories. There's work capacity, uh, which is essentially, you know, you more circuit, body weight type stuff. Hypertrophy, so you're adding of muscle mass to the athlete. And maximum strength, which is your kind of heavy, more traditional barbell lifting. So today I'm going to focus more on the work capacity element of that stuff, just because of the, um, the developmental uh, status and the age of the athletes that we're kind of talking about in this webinar. Um, and also, I guess, just because of the, the constraints of COVID at the moment, you know, potentially people aren't able to go into the gyms um, and body weight training is going to make up the bulk of, of what they're doing at the moment. Uh, and finally, I think you know, even sometimes with some of the you know, older and more elite guys I'm working with, I uh, find the work capacity is often undeveloped in a lot, a lot of athletes. Um, so really building on that base of that pyramid can, can have a real big implication, even on the, the older and more experienced athletes. So when is this appropriate to do? Uh, mostly post-session. So if we're integrating this to, into you know, your, your technical type sessions, uh, you probably want to do this afterwards because obviously you don't want that fatigue to, to again affect uh, the technique in a negative way. Um, or you might do that in a separate session, but obviously it depends on people's constraints, uh, whether you're comfortable with you know, having athletes lift outside of sessions or having separate sessions yourself sort of thing. Um, and then in terms of how to effectively do this, so number one, I guess the diff difficulty of the exercises needs to be appropriate for that individual. So again, looking at the shapes, uh, is that athlete, is that exercise appropriate for that athlete or not? Um, and using your common sense a bit, and neither progressing the exercise, if it's, you know, you look at the athlete and they're finding it easy or getting bored of it, or regressing the exercise if they're finding it too difficult or their technique doesn't look good. A good balance of exercises, so not just working the traditional muscles that we think about at the front of the body, like the chest and the quads, also thinking about the muscles on, you know, the balancing the shoulder musculature to prevent injury, working on the hamstrings as well, which are still a big producer of power for us. And then time efficient as well. So if you are putting this all together in one session, the last thing you want to do is have an hour of physical preparation after uh, your two hours of kind of um, more event specific work. Um, so making this into some form of kind of circuit style training can be a really effective, especially in the, the winter period. One, it keeps the, the, event, the, the session short. Um, two, it also kind of helps athletes think that they work hard. Um, worked hard and, and makes the session a little bit more challenging especially if all you've got access to is body weight type stuff so in terms of lockdown and getting creative with equipment i've got some examples for you here obviously we'll all be familiar with the push-up uh, great upper body strength exercise so some technical points for this would be having a flat back uh, so keeping the elbows tucked not not allowing them to go too too wide out the side um, and some progressions, as you can see in the video, uh, is more advanced progression where you've added bands and rucksacks. So you can get really creative equipment with equipment to, um, to, to progress these exercises if you need to. You don't necessarily need the barbell stuff. Um, and then if you need to regress that potentially for some of the athletes, either younger or female, or you, know, you can go back to some, some kneeling push-ups or, or similar things like that. Uh, again, an example of a kind of split squat variation. So here getting creative using a rucksack, potentially filled with water bottles uh, or weight plates or whatever it might be that you have to hand uh, to add a bit of load to that exercise. Now my technical points here on my knees are in line with my toes, so not caving in. My shins staying relatively vertical, my chest staying nice and tall. Then my progressions, uh, again on the side, so that's kind of a, a split squat, going into more of a single leg squat. So this is the more advanced variations. That's uh, so things you might do. An easy version with a knee back, and then potentially going down to a box or a chair uh, to, to a bit more of a depth, which is a bit of a hard variation. So you can get still get a really effective training session without necessarily needing a lot of barbell equipment. 
Uh, hamstring strength, so looking at muscular balance now. Hamstrings are especially important um, if you want to do any sprints with your athletes, obviously. Uh, and also just for producing power in a horizontal direction. So even any event can benefit from a lot of this stuff. Uh, my technical points here, my back straight, my chest is up, my shin staying relatively vertical, and the cue that I might use, push your hips back. So that's a single leg RDL version. To also do a double leg version. Um, and then finally, some, some core strength example exercise. So my technical points here, my back's flat, my hips square, no movement side to side. So I'm um, tapping the edges of my shoulder here uh, and my body's trying to resist that rotational force of me falling. Uh, a lot more challenging than it looks. And I can progress the difficulty there, again, by potentially changing the width of my legs. Uh, narrow legs would make it a lot harder because there's more rotational force going through the body. And then an example of putting that all together. So again, the same athlete, multi-events athlete, but starting to specialize in throws. Uh, it's the beginning of winter training, so it's shortly coming out now. He's reported he's doing some barbell lifting at a public gym in his own time. So immediately, like, using my observation skills, I'm going to start to speculate a little bit there. Probably going to ask him what, what type of stuff he's doing. Uh, he's probably, in this hypothetical case study, going to say, well, he's, a, he's a young male athlete, he's doing bench press and squats. Okay, so I know he's doing some of that stuff already, so I potentially want to give him some different stuff. Uh, so this might be what a session might look like. So beginning winter training, so I'm very keeping it short and sharp. It's only a 10-minute kind of circuit, four exercises, uh, reverse lunges with a rucksack, some face pulls to balance out the shoulder musculature, and some core work as well. So again, what he's probably not doing in his own time in the public gym. Uh, and working in this circuit format should mean that the whole session should only take about 10 minutes. So it's ideal you know, for integrating athletes back into training. Um, you don't want to keep the sessions too long. They're just getting back into it, you know, September, October sort of period. So 10 minutes just at the end of the session. Cool. So um, wrapping up, uh, I think number three kind of uh, important points uh, that hopefully I got across. Number one, working on all the physical pillars, uh, so mobility, power, and strength. And depending on the level of athlete that you're with um, and what time of year it is, you might emphasize different ones at different points. But again, it's thinking about, I guess, thinking about those performance problems, those the observation skills, think about what's gonna take that athlete to potentially help that athlete get to the next level of their performance. Number two, uh, plan ahead to maximize your training time. So I probably hear this quite a lot in terms of, of well, you know, we have so much of this physical preparation stuff, we've got so much technical stuff to do as well. Um, how do we do it all at once? You know, like it is, it is a challenge. So um, I think really my answer to this one is typically around really good planning, uh, really thinking through like how your session will look and, and what to do with athletes when, when they're doing not much and how to keep, keep them busy and, and productive. Um, so, for example, using circuit style stuff, um, you can do a lot with a little. And you don't need massive amounts of physical preparation. It doesn't need to be an hour long gym session. You, know, you can do a lot with 10 minutes. And finally, um, using your eyes and your common sense. So thinking about, is this appropriate for that individual? Are the shapes that I'm seeing uh, correct? You know, does that look like what it looks like when the elite athletes do it? Um, and you, like, you know, really think about, okay, am I getting what I want from that exercise? If I'm not, I'm going to either regress that exercise uh, when I need to. So yeah, I think that's it for the presentation. Thank you guys for all attending. Um, and uh, any questions uh, five and through now? Uh, Hopefully, I can see them get them up.
I forgot to mention as well, guys, um, if there are any, um, you know, if you want access to these slides, I'm sure they'll be sent out as well. Um, and I'll provide my email as well with the slides. So if you've got any further questions afterwards that you reflect on, then I'll be happy to answer them too. And I'll just give it a few minutes for any questions to come through if there are any. Okay, cool. Looks like no questions for me. So, um, but if you guys have any, um, do have any further reflections or uh, questions, or want to get in contact, or we'll see the slides. Um, you know, I'm sure that will be sent out by email shortly. So, thank you all for attending. Um, I hope your lockdowns are going well. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.